Hey everyone, it's Mr. Drake. Today's video is going to talk about farmers and the difficulties they faced uh, in the West in the late 19th century and their political responses um, in an attempt to make their situation better, bringing about the rise of the populist movement and the populist party. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. First, a look at what the problems were being faced by farmers in the late 1800s. Commercial farming became really big at that time out in the West, and it was hard for your just average run-of-the-mill farmer to keep up with these large bonanza farms. And the only hope these small farmers had of keeping up was by producing more and more crops, which would, have, of course, lead to a decrease in the price because you're driving up the supply. So it was sort of a vicious cycle in that regard. To make matters worse, a lot of farmers owed a whole bunch of money to the bank um, for their land, and it was hard to pay their mortgages off and make their mortgage payments if they weren't bringing in money because prices of crops were going down or they weren't able to grow enough because of drought or whatever. Um, by 1894, one-fourth of all farms in the state of Kansas were owned by a bank, um, which just shows how um, much difficulty these farmers were having. They were also pretty dependent on the railroads. As they got further and further away from urban areas out in the west, they had to rely on railroads to ship their um, crops to market. Uh, and railroads charged a whole bunch of money uh, to do this. And they charged a lot, especially to the more rural small farmers, because it was more expensive to uh, ship goods over those distances. Uh, railroad companies would often um, entice large commercial farmers with discounts or rebates um, to, to ship humongous amounts of crops, but um, small farmers didn't produce enough to, to incur those, uh, uh, those rebates. So it becomes really difficult um, for them there paying money to the bank and to railroad companies and just, you know, losing money hand over fist. Um, Weather, like I said, is an issue. Uh, there were really bad droughts throughout the 1880s in areas where it doesn't rain much anyway in the Great Plains. And then the really bad blizzards of the 1880s make things uh, even worse. Um, pests like grasshoppers would often uh, damage crops uh, in that place. And despite all of these problems, the government just doesn't give a lot of assistance because most government officials at this time believed that it wasn't the role of the government to prop these people up. Um, the biggest issue that farmers had was with the uh, cost of railroads, with their shipping rates. And in 1877, the Supreme Court actually ruled that states had the right to regulate railroads in the case of Mum versus Illinois. Could uh, set ceilings, for instance, on how much they could charge to ship goods. That was overturned in 1886 by Wabash versus Illinois, which severely limited the state's powers to regulate um, interstate commerce. But it did lead to the regulatory agency, the Interstate Commerce Commission, um, which was supposed to oversee you know, railroad shipping costs and stuff like that. But uh, it wasn't terribly effective, and they weren't terribly interested in uh, limiting what railroads could charge for the most part. As a reaction to all of these difficulties, farmers began to organize themselves, first in the 1860s and 70s in organizations, usually at the local level, called the Grange, which would set up cooperatives to help keep prices up and costs down. They would essentially work with each other to determine how much of each crop was going to be grown so that um, nothing got overproduced driving the price down. Uh, it was tried to be, they tried to be for everybody's benefit essentially. Um, the Grange was also a social organization that tried to unite people in very remote areas and just make life out west not as brutally difficult um, as it had been for many people. By the 1880s, the Grange had been replaced by farmers' alliances that stretched from coast to coast, and there were local ones and uh, national ones. There were even uh, farmers' alliances for African Americans. Uh, the Colored Farmers National Alliance is what it was called. And um, they would help their members, again, uh, to you know, regulate um, production, control prices, and generally help them fight the man. And by the man, I'm talking about railroads uh, especially, but also banks and stuff like that. And eventually, this uh, all becomes a political party uh, called the Populist Party or the People's Party, which was formed in 1892 and ran its first candidate for president that year, uh, James B. Weaver.
The platform of the Populist Party was known as the Omaha Platform, named after the city where they held their first convention in 1892. One of the big things the populists pushed for was bimetallism. Uh, that means currency based on gold and silver. Uh, at that time, the gold standard was in place, which meant that uh, all American currency was backed up by gold. And the populists wanted there to be currency based on gold and silver as well, uh, so they could increase the amount of money in circulation and help people who were struggling financially, especially farmers. And the reason this would really help them is farmers had fixed rate mortgages usually, which meant that the amount of money you owed to the bank didn't change based on inflation or deflation of currency. Um, that amount of money was set. So if you had more money in circulation, there'd be inflation and the value of the dollar would go down, but um, you, would have, you would be holding more money. Right, So it would be easier to pay off your mortgage if you had a higher dollar amount in your possession, regardless of what that dollar was worth. So they pushed for bimetallism primarily for that reason. They also pushed for government ownership and control of the railroads because they saw railroads as being the enemy who was you know, charging exorbitant amounts to... Uh, to ship their goods and causing them more financial trouble there. They asked for a graduated income tax, and the government really had no right to collect an income tax at this point. This is before the 16th Amendment is passed. That wasn't until 1913. But uh, they wanted people who made more money to pay more in taxes. They also pushed for a reduction in the tariff. Uh, this is primarily in response to the 1890 McKinley Tariff, which raised tariff rates in the country to 49%, their highest ever rate. The populists knew they couldn't win with agricultural support alone, so they put some measures in place to try to get um, industrial workers and, and urban dwellers to vote for them as well. Uh, they began making pushes for things like the eight-hour workday, limits on immigration so that the working man's job would be safer, and they also wanted measures in place to keep companies from breaking strikes. So again, this is an appeal to organized labor and to poorer uh, city folk as well. Weaver obviously doesn't win the election of 1892. He comes in second behind the two major party candidates, Cleveland and uh, Benjamin Harrison, but he does gain the party some momentum heading into future elections, and the populists managed to get people elected at the local and state level in 1892 and 1894. Uh, the governor of Kansas for a time, for example, uh, was a member of the populist party. Uh, during this time, the Democratic Party split on the issue of gold and silver, uh, into two factions known as the Gold Bugs and the Silverites. And heading into the 1896 election, it looked like the gold side would win out. That was um, what President Cleveland pushed for. Most higher-ranking members of the party were in favor of the gold standard. But then a dark horse candidate emerges and takes the nomination, uh, and that is William Jennings Bryan of Nebraska, who gives a speech at the convention that just gets everyone worked up into a total frenzy that's known as the Cross of Gold speech, where he says, you know, if you want to come out and defend the gold standard as a good thing, we're going to fight you. And his famous line at the end of the speech was, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And the crowd went insane at the convention and carried him off on their shoulders. And he got the nomination, despite not really being a serious candidate for it. Um, so Brian uh, puts the populists in a bit of a... Uh, conundrum here, because they're technically still their own political party, but Brian believed in a lot of the stuff the populists already believed in. So the populists said, well, we could do one of two things here. We can nominate our own candidate and run a third party candidate and split support uh, between Brian and whoever we nominate, or we can throw our lot in with the Democrats and endorse Brian, who's their candidate, and that's what the Democrats decided to do. So Brian was the Democratic candidate in 1896, but he's widely regarded as being a populist um, because it was sort of a fusion, if you will, of those two parties. 
For their part, the Republicans nominated the governor of Ohio, William McKinley, who was in favor of the gold standard and had the support of your typical run-of-the-mill pro-business uh, Republican establishment. Uh, McKinley didn't campaign much. No one at the time up to that point really had. He ran what he called a front porch campaign where he essentially stayed home in Ohio and answered some questions from reporters here and there and let his campaign manager, such as his best friend Mark Hanna and other party operatives throughout the country, do the campaigning for him. On the other hand, Brian barnstormed all over the country uh, for, for him and the rest of the Democrats and ran uh, what is often called the first modern campaign, uh, where he went all over the country and gave speeches to essentially anybody who would listen, um, giving the stump speeches that we take for granted in modern presidential campaigns. And uh, a lot of people in the country were impressed with Brian's stamina and his youth. Uh, he was the youngest person ever to run for president for a major party. He was only 36 years old. Um, but uh, for reasons we'll talk about in a second, it just wasn't enough, and McKinley manages to win uh, pretty handily in the Electoral College. The popular vote was fairly close. It was about 51 to 47, but uh, won handily um, in the Electoral vote. Here's the Electoral College map from 1896. As you can see, McKinley carries the industrial states of the Northeast and the Midwest, uh, while Bryan manages to carry the uh, solid South and most states out in the West. But uh, those areas are fairly sparsely populated. Uh, McKinley uses um, the Republican wave in the Northeast and the Midwest to uh, get elected fairly easily. So the question remains, if Brian puts himself out there as the candidate of the common man during the election, why did he fail so miserably? And there's plenty of uh, blame to go around as to why uh, Brian came up short in the 1896 election. Uh, one of the main reasons is most Democrats just didn't trust him. Uh, even though he's in favor of bimetallism, the vast majority of Democrats, including, again, the president uh, at the time, Grover Cleveland, was in favor of the, uh, the gold standard. So their support for Bryan was pretty tepid. They certainly hadn't supported him at the convention where he got the nomination. Um, political machines in big cities that would often have uh, drummed up support for the Democratic candidates, such as Tammany Hall in New York, they just focused more on local and statewide elections instead of the presidential election. William Jennings Bryan himself also alienated people whom support he really needed, especially immigrants. Um, as you can imagine from his famous speech being called the Cross of Gold speech, uh, Bryan was fairly religious, and he is from Nebraska, and he's kind of this, you know, um, extremely Protestant, devout uh, guy. And he sounded like one of those big, booming, you know, preachers that you kind of think of stereotypically. And um, to be honest, he scared the crap out of Catholic immigrants in the Northeast who, you know, had been hearing all of this uh, anti-Catholic rhetoric coming from Southern religious types for, for years. Um, so they never trusted him either, and he really needed their support. There's also um, uh, suggestions out there that a lot of employees were pressured to not vote for Brian. Um, the extent to which that's true is... Uh, you know, up for debate. And if you want to talk about suppressing the vote, obviously the Democrats did plenty of voter suppression in the South uh, during that time. So that one might be kind of a zero-sum game. Fact of the matter is, for the Populist Party, this was an unmitigated disaster. They risked everything they had to use a gambling or a, uh, a poker term. They went all in by fusing with the Democrats in 1896, and it did not pay off. So the support for bimetallism dwindled throughout the late 1890s as they lost power uh, and influence. Uh, it also didn't help their cause that uh, gold was found uh, in the Yukon Territory and in Alaska in the late 1890s, which increased the gold reserves and made bimetallism kind of pointless. Um, and eventually America goes on the gold standard in 1900. Also in 1900, um, William Jennings Bryan runs for president again and loses to McKinley again. He would then run again in 1908 as the Democratic candidate and lose then too. So the um, guy just could not quite get over the hump. That will do it for today. Um, if you have questions, post them in the comments here or ask me in class. Cheers.